Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it? As we go through this journey of life and the challenges that we face, how many of us find ourselves grumbling and complaining instead of praising God? And so that's a challenge to sing a song like that, isn't it? But our God is so good and He's so gracious and He's so kind and so, so long-suffering. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. All right, well, let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity that we can gather as the church of Jesus Christ to worship you. You deserve all of our worship and a million times more. And so, Father, I pray that today, as we have already sang these wonderful songs, truth-saturated songs, that we would be prepared to hear a word from you today. I'm nothing. I'm just a mouthpiece. The Bible's clear. You don't need me. You can have the rocks cry out praise unto Jesus Christ. But I pray, Father, that you would use my meager attempt to make sense of this passage. I pray that you would use it in the lives of all of us in this congregation, that we would be the kind of church that is pleasing to you. Uh, Chapter 12 is all about church life and how we function within the body of Christ. So, Father, may we as a congregation not be hearers only, but doers of what we hear. May we be purposed today to be the kind of people that walk out our faith tangibly in front of one another and in front of a world that desperately needs hope. So, God, I pray that you'd bless this time. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So when my my kids were uh, a little younger uh, and all still lived at home, and maybe they were having a selfish season. I don't know, Lauren, if little Ellie's had selfish seasons or, uh, yeah, I, 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 in her little autumn, perhaps she's had a few days where she's been feeling a little selfish. Well, when our kids were older and they were still struggling with selfishness, you know, I would uh, have a loving response to try to help them navigate through those emotions of selfishness. And I would just simply, as they were standing here, I would just say, well, the world doesn't revolve around you. The world doesn't revolve around you. The world doesn't revolve around you. I maybe that wasn't very loving. And maybe that's not a parenting tip you should take. But I do think it got the message across that it's not all about us. It wasn't all about them. Because the world doesn't all revolve around us. And, and if we're all going to be honest this morning, we all struggle with selfishness from time to time. We do. We can easily walk through this life with the attitude that we are super important, we are absolutely crucial, we are critical to everything that we engage in. And without us, boy, things might just fall apart. Well, if you struggle with that, you don't need to feel alone uh, because... Paul dealt with this a long, a very long time ago. Um, selfishness was rampant in the church of Corinth, for instance, where they were exalting themselves. And, and even apparently the church at Rome was struggling with self-exaltation. So Paul takes the opportunity in this text to talk about a Christian's attitude re- regarding their gifting and their position. I do want to encourage you to spend time intentionally going through Romans chapter 12 and really read it applicationally because it is application after all. And you will find, if you're like me, you'll find a great deal of conviction that comes along with reading this passage. So if you're not a believer in Christ today and you happen to be here, I am so grateful you're here. And I want you to turn and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I, uh, I, I've followed Christ since 1991, and I have never regretted one millisecond of it. It's been difficult, but I've never regretted it, and I will never regret it for all of eternity. And so I invite you to come to know Jesus Christ today. But today is really going to be a focus on followers of Christ and how we should be functioning within the context of the church. And that really leads to the main idea of what I want to share with you this morning is get over yourself by getting behind one another. Get over yourself by getting behind one another. And You'll find out what this means as we walk through the text, but maybe even now you're asking the question, well, how do I do this? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
Because Paul gives two general ways that this takes place. And I, I hope you're taking notes today because I think you'll find it to be very helpful. And the first way is this, get over yourself by getting an accurate understanding of yourself. So we can get over ourselves if we have an accurate understanding of ourselves. In a day and age where we are selfie focused and self focused, it's really a hard thing to hear that we need to get over ourselves. But one thing I like about the Apostle Paul is that he pulls no punches when discussing our desperate state before God apart from Christ. Look at Verse 3 with me in Romans chapter 12. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So Paul, right in this text, starts by extolling the grace of God. And if you remember from last week, Paul admonishes the church at Rome uh, to, to uh, live in light of the theology uh, that of chapters 1 through 11, to offer their bodies as a living sacrifice, which was their spiritual act of worship. Now he gets more specific as to how this works out in the Christian church, what this actually looks like in the Christian church. And, and, but before he lays out his challenge to them, he lets them know that the only reason that he has any authority to speak to them is by the grace of of God. That's it. He says, by God's grace, I stand before you. By God's grace, I'm challenging you in this way. So Paul is not saying you better listen to me, and I'm not saying you better listen to me, but by the grace of God, we better listen to what God has to say in his word. Folks, I'd never want to be a church where you listen to what Mark has to think. It really doesn't matter what I have to think. We need to be a church that is determined to believe what God has to think and what God has revealed to us in his word, all right? And so he stands before them. He talks before them by the grace of God, right? For by the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone, and notice what he says, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. In other words, you're not all that and a bag of chips. My brother-in-law came up with that, or he says that all the time. Oh, you're not all that and a bag of chips. I don't even know what that means. But oftentimes, we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. And so we're not all that and a bag of chips. It's an interesting admonition that Paul gives in this verse. In the Greek, the word think or variations of that word come up four times in this text. Now, just a hermeneutical principle for you. If you see a word show up over and over again in a text of Scripture, especially in a very short period, it, it means something important. Okay, So he says think or variations of think four times in this text. And apparently Paul wants them to be very honest about themselves with themselves. Well, what's behind this? Well, perhaps Paul is tapping into the tendency that we all have, the tendency to think that it's all about us. My old boss, as I've shared with you guys many times, would often say, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. And it's so true. We're not much, but we're all we think about. And and in our defense, it's kind of hard not to because we're with ourselves 24-7. And so it takes real discipline to start not thinking about myself so much. It's the art of self-forgetfulness, right? It's not about thinking about yourself less. It's thinking, it's thinking, or thinking less of yourself, rather. It's about thinking of yourself less. That's how we need to live. And that's what I think, Paul is driving at here. We can easily start to think that the success or failure of an organization or even a church is dependent upon me. It is not. It's God's church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's God's thing, right? I remember when I left Lakeshore Baptist Church, I thought I was a kind of a big deal around there. And I... I, I, The reality was, I was not. 
I wondered in my heart of hearts, in my secret heart, I wondered if the place would fall apart without me. It did not. In fact, it has thrived without me. Praise God. That's what's supposed to happen. I'm not all that in a bag of chips. When I left love in the name of Christ to come here, the organization did not fall apart. I mean, I was the executive director. That sounds very important, doesn't it? Usually in nonprofits, they give you those big sounding titles because they don't pay you very much. But I was the executive director. Surely as I left there to come here to minister, that organization would, would, would languish without my presence. It did not. In fact, I can say unequivocally, it has thrived. It has grown. It is far better now than it was when I was there. So the moral of my story is this. Get rid of me and things will get better around here. I am not God's gift to ministry, and neither are you. Neither are you. None of us are. None of us are indispensable. And the sooner we come to grips with the fact that, that God's church will go on without us, the better. The church has endured since her inception at Pentecost, and the individual members, including the Apostle Paul, who penned this letter, have not. Paul's in heaven enjoying God right now. He's, he's hanging out with Jesus. But the church has marshaled on even in his absence. They're waiting for us, and one day we will be with them. Uh, such a great uh, cloud of witnesses that Hebrews talks about. But the church will continue until the Lord comes back to get her bride. And we have no idea when the Lord will come for his bride, but he will. He will come for his bride, and, and, and it may even be past our lifetime. And that's okay, because if we die before he returns to bring the corporate body with him, to him, we will already be with him. You are not necessary for this to take place, but you are the glorious recipient of this beautiful reality. It's what you receive. So God doesn't need you. He, doesn't, he, he needs no one. He needs nothing to accomplish his will. If God needed anything, he would cease to be God. So don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. That's what the Apostle Paul is driving at here. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Think of yourself, the text says, with sober judgment. In other words, be realistic about your strengths. Be realistic about your weaknesses. Okay? Don't be like Diotrephes. Are you familiar with Diotrephes? That, young parents, that is not a name that you want to name your children after little Diotrephes. Why? Because Diotrephes was about to get rebuked by the Apostle John. In 3 John 9, Paul or John writes these words, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So this guy was a leader in the church but he was like, I don't really care what the apostles have to say. I don't care what leadership has to say. I'm doing my own thing. I'm on my own program, and nobody tells me what to do. He enjoyed the preeminence. He enjoyed uh, the accolade of being the upfront guy. Instead, instead, we're not to be like Diotrephes. Instead, we are to walk in humility. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. It says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Look at this. This is what I want you to see. Clothe yourselves. That's an interesting metaphor, right? It's just an interesting picture, word picture. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. Why? Because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, Sam is a big dude, and I would not want to tangle with Sam, Right? I shouldn't want to do that, right? No, it wouldn't be good. He'd be very nice to me. But imagine as strong and as, as, uh, as vibrant as Sam is, if God were to oppose him, how well would Sam do? Not well, okay? We don't want to oppose the God of the universe. We want to be very careful about how we handle our Lord. Is he our friend that sticks closer than a brother? And everyone said, right. Does he love us with an everlasting love? Amen. But he's also 
God very God. And it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. We ought not to take him for granted, right? We need to be careful about that. And that should help us to walk in humility. So what helps us to stay humble? Number one is know what you truly deserve. Believer in Christ, what do you truly deserve? Hell. We deserve an eternal condemnation. Eternal hell. Not a temporary hell, but an eternal hell. That's what we deserve. That should help keep us humble, knowing what we deserve. Number two, know that everything you have and everything that you can do are from God and God alone. That's it. Your salvation and anything. The fact that you are sucking air right now is a gift from God. He can stop your heart at any point in time. It's all a gift from God. And when we look at it with that framework, we're able to to walk in humility, thanking him for who he is. So remember, you're not all that in a bag of chips. But secondly, you are gifted by a God who is all that. You are gifted by a God who is all that. Look at the text. It says, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. God has assigned. Paul's about to launch into a brief discussion about spiritual gifts. And the first thing that he wants them to understand is that they are gifted by God. It's God who assigns your spiritual gifts. It says each in the text, meaning every individual Christian is uniquely gifted. And then it says, according to the measure of faith, the exact, in other words, the exact proportion of the spiritual gift. In the MacArthur Study Bible, he says, faith is not saving faith here, but rather faithful stewardship, the kind and quantity required to use one's particular gift. Every believer receives the exact gift and resources he or she needs to fulfill their role within the body of Christ. I want you to tuck that away. Because we're really going to hammer on that in just a minute. Last week's, um, um, what's your name? Dennis, yeah. Dennis came up to me afterwards. He said, you not only stepped on my toes, you kicked me in the shins and, and other things he said. It's, I'm not trying to step on toes. I'm not trying to kick you in the shins. But I am trying to motivate you to be the church that God has called us to be. We're not saved to sit, folks. We're not saved to sit, we're saved to serve. And so you have been gifted for a purpose. It says that God has assigned. Your gifting is because of God's will, not your own. Your gift is from God. It does not originate with you. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says this. And, and all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually. How? What does it say? As he wills. This, this thought really helps us to get over ourselves. How so? Because God is in charge of everything and you and I are not. God, by his grace, has saved you and has given you new and eternal life. He's, he also tabernacles within you. God's spirit lives in you, believer. I mean, just, just, just meditate on that. The Shekinah glory cloud that we read about in the Old Testament. Now tabernacles or temples within you. It's amazing. And the indwelling spirit of God, uh, he gives us these gifts so that we can work in the context of the church. You don't pick your gifting. If we all picked our gifting, I think 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 would indicate we would want to pick the most spectacular gifts, the ones that would give us the most notoriety. But God doesn't give us that luxury. He says, no, this is how you will be gifted, and this is how I want you to use your gift. He wants us to use it in the best way possible. And I think, I think that you and I can trust God with his gifting decision, don't you? So what's the point of all this? What's the point of all this? When we truly understand who God is, who we are, and how God has gifted us, 
then we are positioned to be used of God, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of the body. We're positioned to be used in a powerful way within the body. Folks, church, understand, God could have chosen any vehicle to get his will accomplished in this age. He could have chosen corporate America. He could have chosen any vehicle. He chose the church. It's the church of Jesus Christ that is the vehicle, the pillar, as Paul tells Timothy, the pillar, the buttress of the foundation of the truth. That's our, that's our wonderful privilege. So a little test to see if you need to get over yourself. And this test is actually found in this little booklet, which is actually a chapter of a bigger book from Stuart Scott. And this chapter is called From Pride to Humility. So if you, if you don't like the fact that you're pride, prideful, this would be the book for you. If you don't want to know if you're prideful, this would not be the book for you. It's a wonderful, wonderful book to help you grow in this area. I'm going to go very fast here, but I want you, so I want you to buckle up because there's 30 things I'm going to go through really quick. And it's just a test to see if you, in fact, are a prideful person. Number one, complaining against or passing judgment on a God. A proud person in a difficult situation says, why does God do this to me? How dare him? Number two. A lack of gratitude in general. Proud people usually think they deserve what is good. Uh, that, and so they tend to be critical if they don't get what they, what they think they deserve. Number three, angry. A proud person is offering, often a very angry person. One's anger can be outbursts of anger or withdrawing or pouting or frustration. Uh, an angry look has been called a silent murder. Uh, and so... Persons often become angry because their rights or their expectations are not being met. Number four, seeing yourself as better than others. A proud person is usually on top of and looking down on others. He usually gets disgusted or has little tolerance for differences. Number five, a proud person having an inflated view of your importance, gifts, and abilities, which is what Paul is really talking about in this chapter. Number six, being focused on the lack of your gifts or abilities. So uh, number five is all about how inflated you are about your gifts and abilities. Number six is about how you're not gifted. So some, peop some proud people may not come across as proud at all because they are always down on themselves. And this is evidence of pride because of they are, one is focused on oneself and, and wants self to be elevated Having this woe-is-me attitude is self-pity, which, in fact, is pride. Number seven, perfectionism. Everything has to be perfect. That's a sign of pride. Number eight, talking too much. Talking too much. Proud people who talk too much often do it because they, they think what they have to say is more important than any, what anyone else has to say. Number nine, talking too much about yourself. Proud people may center themselves in a conversation, always bringing it back to their accomplishments and their good personal qualities and so forth, bragging or boasting. Number 10, seeking independence or control. Number 11, being consumed with what other people think. You would think that, that I mean, this is that fear of man thing, and, and, and when you start to focus on what everybody thinks about you, it's all about self, which is all about me, which is pride. Being devastated or angered by criticism. Somebody cr critiques you. You become frustrated or angry. That's a sign of pride. Being unteachable. Many, many proud individuals, they're know-it-alls. They're superior. They can't seem to learn anything from anyone else. Uh, number 14, being sarcastic, hurtful, or degrading. Talking down to people. Uh, using, using snarky comments can be a sign of pride because you're elevating self. A lack of service. Hey, we're halfway done. A, ha a lack of service. Uh, proud people may not serve because they're not thinking of others. They're always thinking about themselves. A lack of compassion. Uh, number 17, being defensive or blame-shifting. A, a, a proud person might often say, well, are you saying it's my fault? Well, what about you? And they automatically, you know, when, when you lovingly confront them on something, they say, well, yeah, but you did this, 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 and this. Because they don't want they don't want to be confronted and change and grow in Christ-likeness. Number 18, a lack of admitting when you are wrong. A proud person uh, makes a many, many excuses. I was tired or I was just having a bad day and so forth. Number 19, a lack of asking forgiveness. Proud people rarely admit their sin and ask for forgiveness. Number 20, a lack of biblical prayer. Proud people just don't pray very much. 
And why would they? They don't need God. They can do it on their own. Number 21, resisting authority or being disrespectful. A proud person may detest being told what to do. They, they, he or she has a submission problem to authority. And what they actually have, however, is a pride problem. Uh, voicing preferences or opinions when not asked. A proud person uh, might not be able to keep his preferences or opinions to himself. Number 23, minimizing your own sin or shortcomings. Number 24, maximizing others' sin and shortcomings. Number 25, being impatient or irritable with others. A proud person might be angry with other people because they are concerned that their own schedule or their own plans are being ruined. They are inflexible and on preference issues. Number 26, being jealous or envious. Number 27, using others. Number 28, being deceitful by covering up sins, faults, and mistakes. Number 29, using attention-getting tactics. A proud person may try to draw attention to themselves by the way they dress or bizarre behavior or so forth, but it's all about self again. And then, number 30, not having close relationships. A proud person oftentimes don't have close relationships and, and uh, because they think that the trouble outweighs the benefit. 30 areas, and if you dig into these, they're very convicting. And I hate that list, and I love that list because it shows me all the areas that I am prideful. So what do I do about it? That's the question, right? So it shouldn't just be, oh, Mark's making me feel bad. That's not the goal. The goal is what? Christ-likeness, right? Christ-likeness. These are just indicators of maybe you're walking in pride right now. So what do I do about it? What is the antithesis of pride? And everyone said, humility. Humility. And we are, throughout the Bible, commanded to be a humble people. Because first and foremost, we have a God. We have a Savior who is, in fact, humble. And Paul admonishes the Philippians to emulate their Lord's, Lord in humility. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, and by the way, the church of Philippi were fussing at each other. They were struggling with pride. They were, they were not functioning in a way that was pleasing to the Lord. And so Paul is going to hit it in the head by using Jesus as an example. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. That's an important phrase. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not to his own interests, but also on the interest of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours, where? In Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Is there any better example in the scriptures of humility? I don't think so. Our Lord is the epitome of humility, just in, in the condescending to this earth and wrapping himself in our flesh and walking among us, he demonstrated, just in that act alone, demonstrated profound humility. And then he goes on to die on the cross. What an ignoble, what an embarrassing, what a, by his own creation, and Paul admonishes the Philippians, you have the same mind that Christ has. Get over yourself, is what Paul is saying. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, and at the proper time, he will exalt you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. That's what we're to do. And so I can take the tact with you to say, do better, do better, and shake my little bony finger at you and say, do better. But that's not how it works. You need God's grace for salvation, and you need God's grace for transformation. 
And you need to go to him and say, you know what, all that big list that Mark just read, Lord, I'm failing in so many areas. And I can't change. I can't do it, Lord. Would you grant me your transforming grace to make me more like your son? So you actually humble yourself before the Lord. You don't go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to do better now. And pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Huh? Okay, I'm going to do better now. You can't do better. You need Jesus and his transforming grace to make you like him. Otherwise, we just fall into moralism. And we have a, a list of 25 things that you need to be doing in order to be a better Christian. That's not how it works. You need his transforming grace to make you like Christ. So get over yourself. Get over yourself by getting behind one another. That's what we're going to talk about now. But first and foremost, we have to have an accurate understanding of ourselves. But secondly, number two, get over yourself by recognizing you are part of God's greater whole. All right, this is where Paul's going with this. God saved us, God saved you, and he saved you for a purpose. He saved you to put you in his body so you might function in the body. Look at verses 4 and 5. For as, one, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Well, what is Paul talking about here? There is one body, the church, the bride of Christ. And when you, know, you, when you come to know Christ as your personal Savior, you are now personally involved in something far greater than yourself. You are now part of the body of Christ. There's no such thing as individualistic Christianity. It doesn't work that way. When you become a follower of Christ, you become part of his body. And, and with this body are many members. Okay, So let's talk about this just real quickly. Uh, the difference between the global church and the local church. The global church is the aggregate total of believers around the world simultaneously. So we have missionaries all over the world, and wherever, wherever they're at, and there's other believers in Jesus Christ there, there are brothers and sisters in Christ. They're part of the global church, right? But then we have the local church, and local church are expressions of the global church in specific locations around the world. So I believe that Paul is referring to the local church in this particular passage. And in the context of this, the church is the church at Rome. But in our context, the church is Allendale Baptist Church, our church. I, I, love, my, I love my brothers over at Second Church and First Church and but I'm not responsible for those churches. They're, that's that's God, God and, and Pastor Ken and Pastor Adam. That's, that's their responsibility, right? And Pastor Marine over at St. John's, that's his responsibility. But we are one local expression of God's global church. And while we should not think of ourselves too highly, as I pointed out in the first point here, we must not also think of ourselves too lowly either. I'm no good, I'm terrible, blah, blah, right? Because that's just more pride, isn't it? So we, so we don't want to go there. So how do we navigate through this? We must remember something very important. You were saved for a very important purpose. You play a critical part in the diversity of this body. Everyone sitting in this church has the opportunity to play a role in the diversity of this body. Look at verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. You play an important part in the church. There has been a very discouraging trend in the church over the last 50 to 75 years. Churches have become a spectator event instead of the body of Christ. The big difference, folks. Kyle Eidelman in his book, Not a Fan, and I recommend you read it, likens the American church culture to a football game where the fans are sitting in the stadium and not doing the hard work of being on the field. Listen to this. He says, My concern is that many of our churches in America have gone from being sanctuaries to becoming stadiums. And every week, all the fans come to the stadium where they can cheer for Jesus, 
but have no interest in truly following him. The biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. He goes on to say, the biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. He goes on and says, they want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. So, are you merely a fan of Jesus? Or are you a follower of Jesus? It's a big difference. And moving back to Paul's body metaphor, each part of the human body plays a role in the overall health of the body. Paul, in verse 4, makes it clear that there is unity and diversity within the body. Unity in the fact that we are all unified around a proper understanding of Christ. Pastor Bill today in his class said, it's the church of Christ is a miracle. It's a miracle that this thing doesn't blow up with all the diverse personalities, all of our different experiences, all of our personalities, and all of our sin. It's amazing that this thing doesn't just blow up. The miracle of God. There's, there's unity that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. But then there's also diversity in the fact that we all have a specific function within the body. If you are born again, you have a function within the body of Christ, the local church. You can't function necessarily in the global church. There are ways you can function in parachurch organizations and so forth. But God's design is that you function primarily in the local congregation. This is Paul's point in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. By the way, when we read 1 Corinthians, who is he writing to? Is he writing to the global church? Who is he writing to? A local church, right? So we need to pay attention to that. And look at what he says. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would, make it, would, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, see that? Each one of them, as he chose, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So Christians, you do not, hear me on this, you do not have the luxury of being a fan of Jesus by sitting in the stadium and watching other people work their tails off on the field. It's not right for you, Christian, to come to a service, enjoy all of the benefits of the service, and not participate and serve it all in church life. If you're going to be a part of the family, you have to pull your weight and serve in the body. By the way, church life goes well beyond the main service. There, there's much to be done. And if you are part of the body, you have a God-ordained obligation to function in this body. It's not an option. So figure out how you are gifted and put your gifts to work to serve in this body. If it's not this body, then go find a body that you can serve the Lord in. That's what you need to do. And we need to be faithful in that. Angie, as many of you know, has um, type 1, type 1.5 diabetes. It's called LADA, latent onset adult diabetes. And so Angie has a part in her body that refuses to work. It's her pancreas. Now, somebody with type 2 diabetes will still produce a little bit of insulin, but someone with 0.1 or 1.5 diabetes, their pancreas refuses to work. It doesn't work. And so she has to make all kinds of expensive and inconvenient alterations to her lifestyle to, in order to survive, literally in order to survive. Statistically, she will have a shorter lifespan because, of, because her one body part refuses to work with the rest of her body to keep her body healthy and strong. 
That's just the facts. Do you understand that this same is true of you? If you refuse to work in the body, you're like her pancreas. I'm just going to go along for the ride. I mean, her pancreas is still alive. It's not rotting inside of her, but it's going along for the ride. It's just not doing what it's supposed to do. If God has brought you to this body, he has uniquely gifted you for this body for such a time as this. And if you refuse to use your gifts and your talents in this body, like my wife's pancreas, then we as a body need to come up with all kinds of alternative solutions and alterations to make this church run. I'm sure you've heard the old statistic that 80% of the work gets accomplished by 20% of the people. And in my position, I observe the inner workings of the church. That's my job. I've been doing it for the last 25 years. I think it's pretty accurate. So what if everyone in this body moved from fan to follower? We would, we would get so much accomplished. We would get so much accomplished for God's church and his kingdom. So let me ask you, are you a fan or a follower? Are you a body part that is functioning in a way that is helping this body to flourish? Or are you like my wife's useless pancreas? I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just saying, everyone in this body needs to function for the body and for God. As I mentioned, Church life is more than just the Sunday service. The church is people, and people need to be cared for. And that leads into verse 5. You play a critical part in the lives of the other members. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So when you and I submit ourselves to a local congregation to be a part of the local body, we are committing to love, to know, and to help one another. I mentioned this already, but Pastor Bill is working through the one another's of the New Testament, and and you really should come to the class because it will really inspire you to consider at a deeper level the importance of the one another's. Now, I already did 30, a list of 30 a few minutes ago. I'm going to do a, I'm going to, I'm going to one up it. I'm going to five up it. I'm going to do a list of 35. So buckle up again. And I just want to do a very fast overview of the one another's in the New Testament. I'm not going to explain them. I'm just going to read them. You ready? We are to love one another. We're to honor one another. We're to greet one another. We're to welcome one another. We're to show hospitality to one another. We're to have fellowship with one another. We're to agree with one another. We're to live in harmony with one another. We are to be at peace with one another. We are to be kind to one another. We are to forgive one another. We're to bear with one another. We're to bear one another's burdens. We're to comfort one another, care for one another, confess sins to one another. We are to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to build one another up, to exhort one another, to instruct one another one another, to teach and admonish one another, to sing with one another. Praise the Lord for that. To stir one another to love and good works, to do good to one another, to serve one another, to wash one another's feet, to wait for one another, to be humble towards one another, to submit to one another, to speak the truth to one another, to not speak against one another. To not judge one another, to not provoke one another, to not envy one another. How do you feel? Yes, and I'm asking, how do you feel after going through a list like this, an extensive list like this? Well, I feel grateful. I feel grateful that my salvation is not based on my performance of this list. I've failed many times over, not living out the one another's. I feel grateful that Jesus lived each one of these one another's flawlessly. 
exuded this perfectly. I feel grateful that Jesus lived a sinless life and died to pay for my sinful failures and that I have the promised hope of eternal life because death couldn't hold him. And I feel motivated, not because I'm going to earn my salvation, but I feel motivated to live these one and others out in this body and thus make a little bit of heaven right here on earth. Can you imagine how attractional Allendale Baptist Church would be if everyone faithfully pursued the one another's? It'd be astonishing. What if we were all motivated to live these out? It really would be a little heaven right here on earth. You, my friend, are a God-ordained piece of the puzzle that this body needs to ensure this church is running optimally. You make that much of a difference. Each one of you. Have you ever done a puzzle and gotten down to the last piece and it's not there? Personally, I hate puzzles. I think they're a profound waste of time. But my family likes them, so I'm happy to watch them do them. But can you imagine, you get all the way down to the last part, the last piece of the puzzle, and it's not there. Ah! It's so frustrating to the puzzler, right? You, 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 you are the last piece of that puzzle. You complete our picture. You make a significant difference here at Allendale Baptist Church when you use your gifts to encourage the body. Well, shucks, I'm not all that gifted. I'm not able to do anything for the Lord. Oh, bother. I'm just going to go sit on a chair. Stop it! If you are in Christ, you are gifted by the Holy Spirit. Find your gift. And start to work it and see what God will do through you. Be astonishing. Remember, it is God who gifts you, not you. And it is God's expectation that you use the gift he has entrusted to you. Remember the parable of the talents? It did not go so well for the one who did nothing with his talent and buried it in the backyard. In fact, the owner said, I'm casting you out. I'm done with you. We need to be very careful of how we use those things that God has entrusted to us. By the way, the best way, and there's, there's, there's surveys and tests and things you can take, but the best way to discover your spiritual gift is to start serving and testing and find out where your gift is. The best way is to serve shoulder to shoulder with people in the local church and even ask them, Hey, how do you think I'm gifted? You can find them in Romans chapter 12 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Ephesians 4. They're in the Bible. If you don't know where they are, I'd be happy to show them to you. But please, the best way to determine your gifting is to get to work. Some ideas on how you can use your gifting in the church, maybe preaching or teaching. That's the first place we think, oh, I, I could never preach, I could never teach. Maybe so. Maybe that's not your gift. Maybe leadership is your gift. Maybe prayer is your gift. Maybe encouragement is your gift. Did you know getting a handwritten note from somebody can absolutely change their life? They may be wrestling with something that you have no idea, but you just pen a little note with a special little scripture and you send it in the mail and they open that thing up and they know someone loves them and is pulling for them and is praying for them. You could change their life. Lottie, Lottie sent me a note the other day. Bless your heart. Lottie and Deb, they sent me a little note. And the church a note. Praise the Lord. I don't think Lottie's going to get up and preach next week, are you? No, I don't think so. But she may have more of an impact in this church, and you could have more of an impact in this church if you just be faithful in those things in which God has gifted you in, and you will change the trajectory of Allendale Baptist Church. I believe it. So... I lovingly challenge you. We're going to get more specific in the areas of gifts next Sunday. But I lovingly challenge you to get over yourself by getting behind others. 
Get over yourself by getting an accurate picture of yourself. And get over yourself by recognizing you are part of God's greater whole. And you make a huge difference here at Allendale Baptist Church. None of us have the luxury of treating this local church as a spectator sport. God's mission is too important for you to sit back and watch others do the work of the ministry. It's the one who thinks too highly of himself or herself that refuses to join this body in serving this body and the community around us. Please don't be that person. Be like Christ. We need each other more than you can realize. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to come together. And Hopefully we realize that each one of us, we realize that this church needs each other. And we need this church. So, Father God, I pray that even now in the hearts of people, there would be some commitments made that they would purpose to determine how they're gifted, to not think more highly of themselves than they ought to think, but to determine how they're gifted and start working those gifts in a way that pleases you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.